So thanks a lot. So, so I'd like to introduce uh, Damien Rousson, who's going to give our keynote presentation. Uh, you know, he, he's worked at various places, including the, the Naval Research Lab, Sandia National Lab, Stanford University, where I think he was one of the founders of the, of the Sorcery Institute, which was a Californian nonprofit organization. And one of the projects that that group did was the Open co Arrays project, which was where I think I first communicated with him. And now he's group lead for the Computer Languages and Systems Software Group at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And one of the other reasons I've I know about Damien is I actually have one of his books, one of the few books I bought in the last 10 years, you know, which on, on scientific software design, the object oriented way, which I found really interesting. So I'll just hand over to Damien. Okay, thank you, Hari. Um, so I'll add one new affiliation that's, that's actually not so new. When I found it Sorcery Institute, I also started uh, Sorcery Inc. Sorcery Institute, as I think Harvey mentioned, is a nonprofit focused on education and research and Sorcery Inc. has now become archeologic. I think early on, I was maybe trying to run away from the idea that we were centered on Fortran and we were you know, teaching training courses on software engineering and just using Fortran as a vehicle. And I've decided to uh, fully embrace Fortran. And a lot of what we do is software archeology, span digging through some very old codes, 30 and 40 year old codes. Um, I guess Jeff showed one that's about that old and uh, oftentimes updating them, modernizing them, uh, things like that. So uh, we're calling it archeologic now. And um, so the title of my talk is Fortran at the Intersection, Synergies Arising from the Interplay Between Paradigms. And let's see. So a quick outline. I'll give uh, some brief introductory material and spend the bulk of the talk focused on case studies, looking at open source software that uh, my collaborators and I have been developing. Uh, everything you're going to see is pretty fresh, uh, written over the last uh, year, and most of it written over the last three months and some of it written over the last 12 hours. <laughs> so um, you'll see lots of things that you probably haven't seen before. And uh, before concluding, I wanna talk about uh, intersectionality. So this, this talk sort of has three different meanings. There's a, a literal meaning uh, or the title of the talk, and then there's a technical meaning, and then there's a social scientific meaning that I'll get to at the very end. And I don't actually have a summary slide, partly because my motivation actually sort of serves as a preliminary summary. I always feel kind of bored when I'm writing a summary slide so I think you're going to get the crystallization of what I'm trying to communicate and, and I guess what I'm up to with, with software development uh, in, in the motivation. So first of all, the literal meaning of Fortran at the intersection. I think the title came, came to me uh, after someone tweeted a picture of my car, uh, presumably at, at an intersection. Hopefully they weren't using the camera while they were driving. Um, and uh, I, I ordered license plates about a year ago and they finally came a few months back. So I actually have Fortran on my license plate now. So this is uh, literally Fortran at the intersection. And um, I didn't know this person at the time. It turns out he's at Berkeley Lab. And fortunately, I heard about the tweet from Andre Sertic at uh, Los Alamos, uh, I think a couple of weeks later. So this is the motivation that I, this is working towards the motivation that I said is also kind of a, kind of a summary. And I think anytime you know, you're asked to give a keynote, um, it's probably a good time to sort of step back and think a lot about what you're doing and you know what you've been trying to accomplish. And I was inspired by a series of books that I read uh, by Michael Pollan. Uh, he's a former UC Berkeley uh, journalism professor who did a number of books on the industrial food supply in America. Really fascinating books. Probably the most famous one is called The Omnivore's Dilemma. And um, you ask, you know, why is a journalist writing about food uh, so much? And it's because he had to do some deep investigative journalism to actually you know, uh, expose what was happening in, in the Western industrial food supply. And after writing a couple of books on food, he was trying to crystallize, you know, what he had come to about food. And he crystallized it in, in this brief statement, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And the eat food part sounds obvious, of course, what else would we eat? Um, but he has his own definition of food. And basically it's that anything that your great, great, grandparents would not recognize as food, he would not define as food because we didn't evolve eating it. So, you know, a Twinkie is not food. You know, um, a lot of the junk food that we might pick up, you know, he would not define as food uh, because it would not be recognizable to someone, you know, 150, 200 years ago. Um, I think the not too much is obviously clear and the mostly plants, there's a lot of uh, evidence for that being a, a healthy way to eat. And so to try and crystallize my thoughts on software, I would say write software, not too much, 
mostly pure functions. And I'm going to spend a lot of the talk on that last part because I realize it's probably the thing that people are uh, maybe somewhat resistant to, for, I think for good reasons. And I'm hoping I can resolve some of those reasons uh, in this talk. The right software part, I'm sort of modeling it after what he's, you know, when he said eat food in the sense that it seems obvious. Of course, we're all at, you know, attending this conference because we're writing software, but I'm going to take, make my own personal definition of software, kind of like he did with food and say that it's more than just writing code. It's things like version control, you know, um, it's uh, document, documentation generation, uh, continuous integration testing, um, you know, uh, unit tests, all, all these different things that we put in place. And I think you'll actually see where some of those really matter and make a difference uh, as at certain points in the talk. The not too much part is the part that I actually probably have the least time to talk about, which is why Jeff Hammond's talk was a perfect setup for mine. <laughs> because when you see him taking deeply nested loops and converting them into a single call to Matmul or transpose, you know, or something like that, that's a large part of what I'm getting at with the not too much. If you can capture what you're doing, if you can capture your algorithm by simply referencing an intrinsic that's built into the language, I recommend doing it. Um, I put in the comments in Slack that I attended a, an Intel compiler tutorial back around 2014. And even back then, they were recommending array statements over lo do loops um, for performance reasons. I don't have personal experience or data to back that up. I don't know exactly what they're doing with the array statements or how much they've achieved. Uh, but I would hope that compilers are moving in exactly the sort of direction that, that Jeff described. So I, I tend to you know, obsessively try to write compact code. Um, and as I said, the mostly pure functions part is what I'll spend a lot of the talk on. And I'll do that with a few case studies from open source software that we've developed. And uh, the first one being a code called Rocket Science. It's a, a, a solver that we use for educational purposes. And along the way, what I really want to focus on is the synergies at the intersections between various programming paradigms. I'll talk about FEATS, which is a, the framework for extensible asynchronous task scheduling. Um, unfortunately, along the way in, in developing it, we realized that the extensible part isn't truly feasible with the current Fortran standard relating to issues around difficulties having uh, or inability to have polymorphism uh, in, the, uh, in the presence of, of, of co-arrays. And so um, we are probably going to have to customize feats uh, for each application that we use it for. Uh, but we'll talk quickly about feats and sort of a proof of concept that we've developed for it so far. Uh, DAG, a library for re representing directed asynchronous graphs. It's a fork of a library that Jacob Williams at NASA developed. And assert, a slightly non-obvious um, and simple utility for writing assertions. So rocket science. Um, the, this, the genesis of, of this code was that we have a client who's working on, uh, it's at a client at a company and they have a proprietary, proprietary application that you know, we won't discuss in any, in any detail, but we, they wanted us to teach a training course, uh, Brad Richardson and I taught it. And something that I have found useful over time is to ask a client, to write a small proxy application that captures an algorithm that plays an important role in their actual production application. And with the instruction, write the proxy app exactly as you would the day before we met. So the result of that, um, many times since you know a lot of code out there is still Fortran 90. And in fact, even a lot of the Fortran 90 isn't leveraging very much of Fortran 90. For example, derived types were in Fortran 90. So the result of that was a procedural Fortran 90 code, just a few hundred lines of code um, in which all of the subroutines had zero or one arguments. It was a time-stepping code and most of them had zero. If they had one argument, it was an integer representing the time step. Um, and the, all of these subroutines were collectively using one common module. Notice the word common there. There were no common blocks, but you can immediately see when you see this style that it was inspired by common blocks. And that one common module contained approximately you know, 40 public module variables. So you know, if you looked at a dependency graph, basically every subroutine in the code depended on this one module. 
which makes the code in some ways really rigid. You make one change in this module and that change can propagate out to affect the entire rest of the code, potentially. Um, so our goal was to demonstrate an evolutionary approach for refactoring the proxy app using more modern programming paradigms. And then to use that process as a case study uh, in the training course. So the programming paradigms that I'll cover um, include functional programming, um, object-oriented programming, parallel programming, and programming by contract. There's a good amount in the literature about object-oriented and parallel programming in modern Fortran. So I'll probably assume some level of familiarity with those uh, uh, for purposes of this talk. There's not as much talk about functional programming or programming by contract. And, but it is often, the case that um, even before a language has a lot of support for a particular paradigm, or let's say a, a lot of explicit support designed to support a specific programming paradigm, there are patterns that can be developed for using that paradigm. So for example, in the 90s, what was very influential on my work was a series of papers that came out about emulating object-oriented programming in Fortran 90. Um, before the language actually became fully object-oriented with inheritance and type extension and what have you. Um, so, you know, what is a pattern in one language might be a feature in another language, and including a future version of the same language you're talking about, um, which also then means that patterns can be strong candidates for, for future inclusion in the language. And without going into any detail, I'll simply note that some of what I say about programming by contract actually resembles some of what we're talking about for future generic programming features uh, in Fortran. Okay, so a functional programming pattern. And the pattern is to write pure functions, including elemental functions. And I'll, since I said I won't have much time to talk about the not too much part, the elemental is part of what I'm talking about. Oftentimes what you would do with a loop or with nested loops, if you can write an elemental function, you can do it in a single line, right? Um, associate names with expressions. And I wish I could remember who told me about this. It was at a Fortran committee meeting, maybe three or four years ago. Um, someone mentioned that if you associate with an expression, then you get immutable state. And so that's maybe one of the things that I'm gonna show you that I think is kind of the most unique in terms of co-opting that fact to support this pattern because it's not something I've seen uh, other people do or at least comment on uh, explicitly. And just to mention one subset of, ex of expressions is a function reference, okay? And, and then we wanna construct whole objects with generic interfaces that serve as user-defined structure constructors. So what that means is no setters. After we, we, we the whole object is constructed uh, on the fly and then we use it we might, we'll have getters to get data from it, um, but we won't then mutate it or change it once it's created. And write expressions based on pure user-defined operators, okay? So you can see that on the right. Um, and uh, in all honesty, I don't know that this is what you'll find, or this is, I think, probably not what you'll find if you go to the Rocket Science Repository today. Um, this is an earlier version of the code, and there's some things that uh, here that I probably would change today. Um, but the basic idea is that we have a minimal amount of state that needs to be propagated or updated over time. Um, and we it cap captured that in what we call a state T object. We're trying to predict rocket motor thrust. So we have a motor abstraction. And then from there, instead of doing a lot of additional declarations, we do associations. So for example, at line 19, it's effectively I'm querying the motor object, give me your chamber. So that's a pure function that's going to return a result. And by associating a name with that result, I get immutable state. So that communicates something to the reader that this chamber object is not going to change within the scope that it's defined. And to the compiler, there are some potential compiler optimizations that can result uh, from the compiler knowing that this object won't mutate, it won't be changed. Um, where you see me call these define type bound subroutines, um, in 
a more recent style, those would also be calling pure function constructors. Um, and, you know, here it's written this way because I wanted to do IO inside the procedure. And so I communicate that by not writing a pure function. So if you get to know this style, then that's what that's sort of telling you. Um, probably today, though, I would uh, have that read or write happen in the main program and, um, and still work with just pure functions. Lower down at line 28, you can see what looks like a time stepping. It looks like that because that's what it is. Basically, I'm querying the motor object and say, give me the time derivative of the state. And then I'm going to multiply that by a time step and then use that as my increment for the state. Okay. So that's the last bullet on the left, write expressions based on pure user defined operators. So each of those operators is something that the programmer is obligated to define, and we choose to define them as pure functions. Okay. So some of the benefits. I talked a little bit about this already. So there's, there's you know, clarity in terms of uh, what the reader sees and knowing what's going to change and what won't change. But also, there's a clarity in the flow of information that doesn't come out as clearly in, in this example. I have uh, some further examples where you'll see this. But the basic idea is when you're looking at a pure function application, and let's say I invoke the function and then associate a name with it, you're seeing a very clear mapping from inputs to outputs, the output just being the result. Okay, because with a pure function, the, uh, the arguments have to have intent n. And so all you're seeing, you're seeing that this state is used to produce that state. And you can know what the inputs are and what the output is without even going to read the interface. Um, there's one more thing I'll mention that just came to mind, but it's not mentioned on the slide anywhere, is that in some ways, this style to me makes Fortran feel almost like a dynamically typed language uh, because you'll notice that, so that at line 19, that chamber object, I don't even have a use statement that brings in the chamber type, but it is, it is a type chamber T. And so the compiler knows that uh, from looking at the interface for the chamber type bound procedure, which is a getter, and it can just take that object, assign it this name, which also means there's no you know, extra copies happening. If I were assigning it, then you know, there'd be an extra, the object would be created and then assigned to the left-hand side and there'd be a type finalization that has to happen. Um, so there's a lot that this style I think is communicating. Uh, there's also benefits in terms of robustness uh, because I mentioned the immutable state and the tight scoping. And this reduces or eliminates whole categories of errors that arise from the traditional declare and define pattern. There are there actually have been some software engineering studies that have found a correlation between the distance between a declaration and the first use of something, a correlation between that distance and the number of faults in the code. Because you declare something as one type, maybe real, and you forget later, not realizing or realizing and treat it as you know complex or something else. Um, and so that kind of error uh, goes away when you don't have to declare and define. Um, and there, by not having setters, the things I'm describing here, I should say, also aren't hypothetical. So one of the libraries we're going to talk about is DAG. And you know, when we were first using it before we refactored it in this functional style, there was a point where we were calling a setter um, from you know the original package that had two optional arguments. And we hadn't realized that when we called it with just one of the two optional arguments to set that argument, we hadn't realized that it was also making a default assumption about the other op our optional argument that we didn't pass. And it was defining that component as well. And so it takes some time to debug things. And now you've got, you've got to go and look at the implementation. That kind of mistake on our part couldn't happen with this style because we don't mutate our objects um, for the most part. So um, also means you can't use uninitialized data, right? Because as I said, with the chamber object at line 19, we don't declare and then later define, it comes into existence fully defined. What are the roadblocks though? Why haven't more people tried this kind of approach? What I commonly hear uh, around writing pure procedures is 
functions can only have one result. What if I want to? Um, producing output for debugging is cumbersome at best. And in fact, most output is prohibited. I'm going to show one way around that. And also, if copies replace mutations, then memory could be used inefficiently. So what we're trying to do is go after each of these. I talked about how the fact that we're doing association means there's not a copy. Um, and I want to talk uh, about how we resolve the other two bullets next. So first, let me outline you know, what we came up with to go from software archaeology, as they say, to modern uh, programming paradigms. So we took the code and set up a Git repository. Um, we established a reference implementation. This is an idea that I got from Brad Richardson, where we took the original main program for the code and made it a function so that we can get a result from it and use that to test uh, our refactored version of the code and test it at runtime by comparing the two results. Um, and we set up a test suite using vegetables, also, also developed by Brad Richardson. And uh, we defined GitHub actions, actions for automated CI testing, for generating and deploying Ford documentation. Um, those are the kinds of things I was talking about when I said write software. Uh, when we come to a new package and we're asked to modernize it or parallelize it or work with it in some way, we prefer not to even touch it without a test suite in place. Um, and so it's a really important part of our process. Uh, by the way, I think I'm hearing uh, messages on Slack and I'm, I'm not monitoring those. I'm, I'm assuming that uh, I'll look at those at the end of the talk if I need to. Um, so we, the next steps then to move towards pure functions are we convert uh, all those module variables to dummy arguments with a specified intent. We also separate procedure interface bodies in modules from procedure definitions in submodules. Um, that isn't necessarily tied directly into the other themes of this talk, but uh, it's, I think it's nice to have that separation. People usually talk about it in terms of compilation cascades, but I think it's also just nice in terms of reading the code. The idea being that I would rather not have to read the entire implementation just to understand how to use something. It's nice to have the interfaces captured in one place so that I can see how do I invoke this procedure, what are the arguments that it needs, what are the attributes of those arguments, and what have you. Um, and then we convert subroutines to pure functions. And the process for that is anything that's intent in doesn't need to change as an argument. Anything that's intent out, we encapsulate in a derived type result. So that way we have one result, but of course it has many different things inside of it. And anything that's intent in out appears in both places. It stays as an intent in argument and it becomes a component in the result. So what we're seeing then is the first form of synergy, synergy that I want to talk about. You know, what happens at the intersection between programming paradigms where one paradigm supports another? Effectively, and, and I'll say that in design patterns, patterns resolve tensions in a program design. So we've got a tension between wanting to have multiple results and only being allowed one. The pattern is to use an object, which is something that is inspired by auditory programming. So what's really happening is that auditory programming here is coming in in service of a functional programming pattern, right? And it can be the case, maybe not always, that this leads to a natural encapsulation strategy. If multiple values are being produced by a given procedure, that's a sign that those values are probably related and that they might be a good abstraction. So even though we sometimes define derived types in this ad hoc manner, it can sometimes lead to natural uh, definitions for the, uh, for the derived types, natural choices for which derived types to define. So the next thing I'll talk about is feats. Uh, the task scheduling framework. And the basic idea, so this is a project that's funded by NASA Langley Research Center, and the client there is uh, Robert Singletary. And he's working on the, the online tool for assessment of radiation in space, Old Terrace. So you could use it to predict radiation exposure for spacecraft inhabitants. You could also use it um, you know, with some assumptions to predict radiation exposure at, the, at a planetary surface as well. 
Um, so the idea here is to break your images up into teams, establish one scheduler image and one or more compute images. And then the schedulers post task assigned events to the, uh, to the compute images in an order that respects dependencies described in a DAG. And the compute images post ready for next task events to the scheduler. And there's a task payload map abstraction that maps task identifiers to task locations inside a co-array that is of type payload T and is named mailbox. So this is how we handle the, uh, the data communication. Um, and the chief difficulty that I mentioned earlier is that that co-array then can't be um, polymorphic. And so we are not able to write the framework in a way that is fully extensible. We had hoped to write it so that it could be used for any application. You could just extend the payload type. Um, possibly, yeah, I think, uh, I think we'll end up having to customize it for, uh, for each application. Other applications, uh, they're at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. I'm working with a researcher, Ethan Goodman, who wrote the Intermediate Complexity Atmospheric Research Model. It's a model for predicting the regional impacts of global climate change. So you take a global circulation model output as your input to a much finer uh, simulation for a given region. And there's a dynamic load balancing issue where it starts to rain in one part of your domain and that the, so you might've divided your grid up perfectly evenly and it looks like it's nicely load balanced, but now suddenly this one region is doing a lot more work because of the precipitation relative to some other region where, where there's clear weather. And of course that changes over time. And so it's a challenging dynamic load balancing problem that I'm hoping we'll be able to solve with work sharing and work stealing where basically uh, one idea is each image further subdivides its data and uh, its, its work. And then the scheduler uh, for, for a given team uh, decides who does what work next with a priority system based on first who owns the data. But if that uh, image is, is occupied and not ready for a next task, then it could be handed off to another image that has the time to do the work. Um, we would like to also uh, think of the Fortran package manager, also first written by Brad Richardson. And now uh, this, by the way, is one of the things that makes me really excited about what's happening in the Fortran world today. You know, this was just released for the first time last year. And last time I checked, I already had 18 contributors um, and was over 20,000 lines of code. And that's actually starting essentially from zero because Brad wrote it in Haskell. And then the community decided to rewrite it in Fortran which is pretty radical, I think, writing a, writing a package manager in Fortran. Um, but it shows what happens when the tooling is actually written in the language of the users. I mean, it's just an amazing grassroots effort. So it's not something that we probably would have the time to do, at least not unfunded. We would like to maybe go after some funding for it, but you could imagine feats being used to enable parallel builds with FPM. Okay, this is a diagram from early in our thinking about this work. So it's not a perfect match to what we're currently doing, uh, but it's the UML sequence diagram and sequence diagrams, uh, time uh, goes, increases as you move down. And, you know, but it's just showing the basic idea that you would have uh, various teams, you'd have a scheduler image on each team, compute images, maybe there'd be an initial loop where the uh, scheduler would hand out one task uh, per image. And then after that, things could happen in, random order, basically, whoever's ready for the next task gets assigned one um, and so forth. And so uh, in a UML sequence diagram, I guess each diagram you see, the one on the left and the one on the right, those are both sequence diagrams. And in a sequence diagram, what's on the top are objects. So we actually have an image abstraction. And so an, Im an image derived type, image T. And so there, one of them is the scheduler image and one is the compute image, but those are actual objects that we're talking about here. Okay, so this is showing the module dependencies inside Feats itself. So we decided to, since we're thinking about FPM as one of the potential target applications, we decided as uh, an a proof of concept example to use the building of Feats 
as an example of what feats can do. So uh, currently what we're doing is we have a DAG that describes the dependencies and we have uh, you know, an object that contains that DAG and we're not actually doing any compiling right now. We're just printing out, this is what I would compile if I, if I were compiling. <laughs> Um, and I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. So here's the DAG. Uh, the open circles are uh, root nodes, root vertices. And so submodules, uh, since we only ever have one submodule per module, there's nothing that can ever depend on our submodules. So those are all root nodes. Uh, the light yellow are leaf nodes. So those don't depend on anything else. Ideally, those would be a great place to start your compiling. Right now, with the kind of search, uh, kind of ordering we're doing on our DAG, um, it doesn't necessarily start with those. Um, and then the blue ones are, I guess, I'll just call them branches. They have things that depend on them, and they depend on something else. So as you can see, it's the frail. Oh, and the green ones are external dependencies. And this is something that the DAG library can write out for you. It's functionality that we inherited, but refactored from uh, Jacob Williams' version of uh, what he calls daglib, and we just call dag. And so it can write out a dot file that you can use GraphViz to turn into a PDF. So let's say you're running our proof of concept with FPM. So you type FPM run, tell it you want to run the example that's in the example folder. This is me running it on my Mac. So I guess the Mac doesn't like MPI and it's making me uh, click a button to allow these various processes to communicate across the network. This is all happening in shared memory, of course. And we're seeing what tasks the scheduler is hand handing out to what image and you know, what those images would be doing, compiling the DAG-M module, compiling the compile-M module, um, all these different parts of the DAG. And um, it gets all the way through to the last one, including uh, the main program. And then unfortunately I hit an MPI error. This is, so I always say every problem is an opportunity. So this is an opportunity for me to extol the virtues of uh, you know, having a Git repository with issues because Brad was able to go and find that. I myself had encountered this issue or at least corresponded with someone about it two years ago. And fortunately that saved me a ton of time trying to diagnose what was going on here. And I'm pretty certain that this is just a, something that's specific to open MPI. I don't know enough about MPI or any specific implementation to tell you why this problem happens with open MPI, but it only happens at the very end. Um, and all of the, everything on the DAG actually completes. And I'm fairly confident that if I just switch to MPitch, this will go away. So, uh, but if anybody would like to help out with some open source software and help us figure out why this is happening with OpenMPI, that would be great. <laughs> um, here's a class diagram for feats. And I'm not going to go through a lot of detail on this. Uh, partly, I mentioned it just to sort of show off what Adam can do. I could, I've been working in Vim for 35 years or more. And um, when Brad first got me to use Atom a little over a year ago, it was the first time I experienced something, essentially an IDE. I mean, Atom refers to itself as an editor, but then you can add, it's open source and people develop these packages for Atom that ultimately make it feel like a full featured um, IDE. And there's one nice thing is there's a package for, for called plant UML that you can use. It's basically a scripting language for describing UML diagrams. Um, so in this class diagram, each box is a class, each box is the right type. And in the ones that have three panels, you're seeing the data, the components basically. And then, uh, so you see the type name at the top and then the components and then the type down procedures. And the reason I'm showing this is to show uh, a constraint. One of the things you can do with UML diagrams in the upper right here is you can use the subset of UML called the object constraint language to write formal constraints, things that you expect to be true in your software. And constraints take three forms. And this is sort of getting into the programming by contract where you're, you want to be sure that certain things are true at the beginning of execution of each procedure. And those are called preconditions. You want to be sure that certain things are true at the end of execution. Those are post conditions. 
And then there are invariants. And so the notation here is indicating that I'm describing an invariant. And invariants apply to the whole class. You can model invariants uh, by translating them to preconditions and postconditions on every procedure. Okay. Um, you can then check those, check these constraints at runtime with an assertion utility. And so that's why I'm going to talk about our assertion utility. And so what this is basically saying is that, you know, think of it as compiling. Every time we do something, a task like compile, we need to have something to do it on, a source code, a source file to work with. Those are the source files are the vertices in that DAG, right? And so the size of our tasks array should match the size of, should match the, match the number of vertices. And so that's what that constraint is saying, basically. So this is what it looks like to construct an application uh, in feats. Basically, on the left at lines 24 and 25, you're seeing um, that uh, we're constructing an application from uh, components, or I guess, let's say lines 12 and 13. An application is basically a DAG and a set of tasks, OK? So that's the derived type that we define for, for applications. <clears throat> it seems we lost our keynote speaker. Let's just wait a bit until he reconnects. Reconnect. Okay. I, I can text him just in case he doesn't know. Oh, that, might be, that might be good. I'm, I'm already doing that. Okay, I won't then. So I just got off the phone with Damien and he said his brand new computer just crashed. So he's he's connecting from his old one, but he'll he'll be on in a minute. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks uh, for the update. <laughs>
So he seems to be back. Let's see. Okay, my apologies. I, uh, my computer has been crashing a lot and I replaced it. So I'm actually present, I was actually presenting from a brand new computer that I just started using a few days ago. And now that one crashes. Uh, so I'm guessing it's a software issue and not a hardware issue. Um, so I've got about eight minutes left. I'll see what I can get through in that time. And my slides, of course, are online. Um, now I'm on my old computer. I don't know which is gonna be safer because the new one, even when I got it to reboot, it crashed again. Um, so do you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay, so I will, since I'm on a different computer now, I will have to go to the conference website, I think, to uh, get the PDF of the talk. Um, yeah, that might be the easiest thing. Um, could somebody post a link to, let's see, where's... The easiest is fortrancon.org. Um, What's that? Fortrancon.org. This would be for the page. And now I'm looking um, for the other computer. I have it on Slack. Okay. I don't see it on, on this one, on this Slack for some reason. There's in the Zoom chat, there is the link. In the Zoom chat, okay, I, perfect. I just dropped the link to your event that has your slides. In okay. Slack. Good. I just got it from the Zoom chat. Then the attachment symbol to the right uh, on your slot. Okay. There's the. Yeah. There we go. Okay, so we just talked about this constraint. And then the point that I'd like to make is that I talked about how an invariant you can convert into a set of preconditions and postconditions on each procedure. And you can enforce that with a runtime assertion. And so we call this assert procedure here on the constructor to enforce uh, the constraint. But because we're using this style, if you look on the left, um, you know, both of the type bound procedures are, are pure, which means their arguments are intent in, and that's because basically they're getters. We're basically guaranteed by the API that that constraint can't again be violated as long as it's true once. And so we only have to actually enforce the invariant in one place instead of actually setting it as a pre and post condition for each procedure. So that's one of the things that the functional programming is buying us and, and, and it's sort of showing how like whole classes of errors uh, go away, basically. Um, this is the actual assert library. Um, it's basically there to promote contract enforcement, um, but also to mitigate against a commonly cited reason for not writing pure procedures, which is the difficulty in, uh, in producing output. So this is the assert subroutine, and it takes as its first argument an assertion, which is a logical intent in argument. That would generally be an expression, like what we just saw, and then a description, a character description of what it is that we're asserting. And then the part that gets us to uh, kind of a more full-featured output facility is the th third optional argument where you can put in some diagnostic data. And notice that that argument is unlimited polymorphic. So you could basically pass in anything. Um, and internally then what we do is actually it's, I think in one version of this also it's unlimited polymorphic and assumed rank. Um, 
No, we use the we use the uh, polymorphism to get around the need for assumed rank. So you can basically pass in you know anything, and then we have ways of handling it inside. If it's intrinsic, we know what to do. If it's not intrinsic, then we provide an abstract type that has a deferred binding that converts that gives output that's a character variable. And we have an example where you could pass in, we have a, a type that we call intrinsic array T. So even though that argument is a scalar, if you invoke our intrinsic array constructor and actually pass that as the argument, and if that either ex extends uh, the abstract type that I mentioned or is wrapped by something that extends it, you now have a full featured output facility at the cost of doing uh, an error stop. Uh, and which is typically what you're doing when you're debugging anyway, you want to figure out what's happening at some specific part of the code that you think might be wrong. If you do that in an assertion, then if the assertion goes through, well, you probably didn't really need the output because you got what you expected there. And if it doesn't, you can now get richer output, um, you know, or, you know rich, as, as rich as you would like in your output, as long as you can take whatever you're doing and convert it to a string, which could even be some big JSON object, you know, or multidimensional array or what have you. So what we're seeing then is programming by contract combined with parallel programming because error stop came into the language to support parallelism. It came in to, term, to uh, terminate all of your images at once. So we're seeing a parallel programming feature coming into contact with the programming by contract pattern that we're describing being there to support functional programming. Okay, um, so I think I'll skip over this in the interest of time. And we, we didn't talk about it in any deep, well, we did talk about the events that get posted in feats, okay? One of the things I'll mention is that, you know, if you look at the Metcalf, Reed, and Cohen book for Fortune 2008, the atomic subroutines were all in a deprecated features appendix. Um, I think that was primarily because the atomic subroutine feature set was too limited at that point. And now the atomics, most of them are not in a deprecated uh, features appendix. But I think the idea being is that even so, if there's some atomics here that um, are so hard to use that they're being deprecated by people who know the language best, then the atomic integer that's inside an event type, that's a private component, is probably something that someone, at least who doesn't have a great deal of depth in parallel programming would not want to be manipulating themselves. And so what we're seeing with the event type is object-oriented programming with private data and a certain limited set of procedures for manipulating that data coming in in service of parallel programming. Um, many of you have seen me give other talks, have seen this slide before, so I think I won't spend much time here, but the uh, basic Damien. idea of Yes. You've been answering the questions in the chat quite well. So I'm quite happy for you to carry on for at least another five minutes or more, if that works for you. Awesome. Okay, great. Basic idea being here that user-defined operators are not just syntactic sugar. You oftentimes hear that, especially from C++ programmers, that you know syntactic sugar is basically something that you could do in another way without this nice syntax. But in Fortran, we have semantic requirement. Well, first of all, in Fortran, we can define our own operators, not just overload existing operators. But we also have at least one semantic requirement for our user-defined operators, which is that they have to be intent in. And I would say that's nudging us in the direction of functional programming. And if we go all the way and actually make these pure functions, then it turns out that this whole expression, which by the way is solving the 3D or multidimensional uh, Navier-Stokes equations, the whole right-hand side can be evaluated. So you're looking at user-defined, purely functional operators operating on distributed objects, objects that, that have color rays inside of them, um, and in a way that can happen completely asynchronously, despite the fact that there's communication that has to happen to compute the derivatives. And the only time we actually end up having to uh, do any sort of segment ordering is when we get down to the assignment, which of course is the part that's non-functional because we're modifying state. So I think if you follow this pattern, it sort of becomes clear where segment ordering is required and where it's not. So I refer to that as the abstract calculus pattern in my book. What we're seeing is that object-oriented programming is giving us a syntax 
that makes the functional programming feel natural. And those are coming together to support asynchronous parallel programming. And also, I guess I'll mention that the object oriented programming has helped us with the diagnostic output on programming by contract. Okay, the last part of the talk was just a few minutes. Um, there's a third meaning to the title, Fortran at the Intersection, and it relates to a concept from the social sciences, intersectionality. And it was originally developed by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, a law professor at University of California, Los Angeles. And she was talking about the intersection between various demographic groups. And specifically, since she's a law professor, she was dealing with a court case where there was a black woman who was suing a company for discrimination against black women and their hiring practices. And the judge unfortunately ruled against her because the company actually had hired quite a few African-Americans, but they were all male, mostly into jobs involving manual labor. And they'd hired quite a few women, but they were all white, mostly into jobs that were secretarial or front office, you know, receptionist type jobs. So when you have someone who's then at the intersection of these two different demographics, there is a special problem that comes up if you don't do manual labor and they wouldn't want you in the front office. <laughs> um, Highly influential work, Google Scholar uh, shows 21, over 21,000 uh, citations. And how that relates to this top, it, talk is that I'm someone from an underdog community working in an underdog language. I probably don't have to convince most people in this audience that Fortran is an underdog. On the left here, going all the way back to 1975, you've got quotes like Fortran, the infantile disorder by now nearly 20 years old is hopelessly inadequate for whatever computer application you have in mind today. It is now too clumsy, too risky, and too expensive to use. Um, you might've heard the term, you can write Fortran in any language. That's a software engineer's way of saying you can write bad code in any language. <laughs> um, fortunately, I think that in some ways things might be turning the corner. Um, is a, an article from earlier this year that says real programmers write Java like Fortran. So Fortran is an underdog. To tie that in uh, with this talk, um, I wanna mention this book, The Jazz of Physics. It's written by Stefan Alexander. He's a cosmology professor at Brown. He's also African-American and performs jazz. And he talks about how his music inspires his physics. And in case that sounds hokey, he's got a couple of great quotes in here, here from Nobel laureates in physics. And I'm gonna jump straight to the one from Albert Einstein where he says, someone asked him about his theory of relativity and he actually said it was inspired by music. So the basic point here is that Stefan Alexander is coming from an African-American music tradition and he's telling you that his music inspires his physics. And I'll let you read the book to find you know, the, the metaphors and analogies that he's using. That should tell you then that a diverse workforce actually does work differently. So to, to bring this back around to Fortran, I would say that not only does diverse workforce do work differently, but it also does different work potentially. This is a, from um, an article that I published last year at a workshop. The article wasn't a technical article, it was actually an interview where Lois Kerfin McKinney's at Argonne interviewed uh, Marianne Leung uh, and myself about experiences related to diversity and inclusion. And one of the things I said was that as an African-American, I see my adopting an underdog language as partly an extension of being outside the dominant culture in STEM fields. At a time 20 years ago, when most people were passionate about, most people who were passionate about improving scientific software were adopting other languages, I found that an ability to embrace difference and combat stigma along one obvious dimension, ethnicity, makes it feel natural to swim upstream or outside the mainstream along another dimension, programming language choice. So a diverse workforce does the work differently and potentially does different work. I'm actually the only Fortran programmer in my group. I'm leading a computer science group at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab now. And, you know, not coincidentally, um, I'm also, as, at least I know of as of a few years ago, I verified with the chief operating officer of the lab to whom the human resources director reported that at that time there were no black staff scientists. Now staff scientists is, is a specific title at the lab. It doesn't mean there weren't any black researchers at all. Um, but what I'm getting at here is not surprisingly then, it, what I'm getting at here is that if you think about this intersection and the fact that that's part of why I made this choice or felt comfortable making this choice, maybe it's not completely coincidental that when they finally hire the first black staff scientist that they've had in a while, they're also doing Fortran for the first time. <laughs> so um, at least in this group. <laughs> 
there are others at the lab who, who write Fortran. So uh, lots of people who've contributed to my work and specifically to the software packages that I mentioned. Uh, I probably missed a few people here. I know for sure I missed Jacob Williams, but I mentioned him earlier. We, we forked off of his library and I'll stop there. Okay, well, thanks very much. Very interesting talk. So I think, as I said, the the, um, the chat has been, I think, amply answered. So I think what I'll do is I'll just open it up. If, if anyone audibly wants to ask a question or two at this point, then we can maybe get a couple of questions in uh, before we close this session. Thanks, Brad, for answering the uh, chat questions. And if no you look problem. at those packages that I talked about, um, I'd say specifically, if you look at DAG, you'll see a completely functional interface where every procedure is a function with intent and arguments. They're all pure except for two procedures that call an external library where the procedures in that library aren't pure for reasons that we would like to address. Brad and I have an idea for um, how to allow pure procedures to return polymorphic results, uh, which they currently are not allowed to in the standard. I mean, one of the questions is why, why didn't you use something like Dask? I mean, I think you already said there was an advantage to using, you know, a completely Fortran ecosystem. So, so where would you draw the line? Would you write anything in Fortran or? Would there be cases where you think, you know, something else is the right tool, I should use that too? Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question. So, I mean, I've programmed in half a dozen different languages, uh, although my career has really focused on Fortran for the past decade or more. Um, you know, the last time I wrote a lot of code in, in something else, it was probably the installer for open core arrays, which is about 4,000 lines of bash. And the reason uh, it's that many lines is because it doesn't just install open core arrays, it will check for the, the prerequisites. And if you don't have it, it will install those. And it will, if those prerequisites have prerequisites, it will download them and, and you know install those. Well, this should probably sound pretty familiar. I wrote all that in Bash, but that's what the Fortran package manager is doing in Fortran. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, there's a, these days I'm beginning to think that there's a sound argument for doing a lot of what we do. Maybe not everything, I'm sure not everything. But a lot of the things that we wouldn't traditionally think of as being Fortran, I think we can do in Fortran. So Marshall has a question. Yeah, uh, a wonderful talk. Thank you, Damien. Um, I have a question, uh, very, very close to Thomas's question. Um, a lot of the techniques you've shown do rely on, well, we'll, we'll say mo for the sake of lack of a better word, modern Fortran constructs. And it's, it's not just a question of um, uh, support within compilers, but sometimes management can be uncomfortable embracing some of these features. And I wonder if you had any advice or experience with convincing people to adopt more modern Fortran constructs. Well, well, I probably don't have the best advice for dealing with management because keep in mind that a lot of what got me this far down this path is that I left a big organization, I was, you know, at, St at Sandia and then Stanford and just went out on my own. Um, so that that was my solution. It won't maybe work well for, for everyone, I'm sure. But as far as compilers go, definitely operating at the bleeding edge, uh, you get cut. We, we, we particularly have a lot of problems with associate uh, with the current compilers. And a lot of times when I would like to do an associate that I can't and I have to go back to declare and define. Yeah, associate was ex exactly the one I was thinking of. Yeah. I mean, in our experience, we've basically chosen the least compatible compiler we can in our in our suite, and yeah. if it matches that, then then we thumbs up on it. But I, I I've never really been comfortable with that strategy, and I just didn't know if other you your group has better advice. Well, you know, basically, at least in our case, since we're you know at Archaeologic and and Source Institute, we're kind of we need to be operating at the bleeding edge because that's our competitive advantage, right? So I made a decision about three or four years ago that I was just gonna go all in on Fortran 2018 and just use whatever compilers could support me. Um, and at the time that was G Fortran, Intel and Cray. Uh, 
Um, and now we can add nag as of about a year and a half ago has essentially everything I want. If there's, if it's not there, I can replace it relatively easily like collective subroutines. Um, so I've seen a lot of organizations do that. And when I've gone down the path of trying to design to the lowest common denominator or lowest common subset of supported features, you end up almost all the way back at Fortran 90. And I just, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't, <laughs> I'd rather narrow my set of compilers than, you know, and, and I'd rather engage with the compiler teams. You've got to submit bug reports. You've got to submit very small bug reports, trim out all the fat you can possibly trim out. The compiler developer, maybe Bill Long can help me with this one. I've always imagined that if you look at the job description for a compiler developer, there's nowhere in it that it says, understand Damien's problem. The job description says, fix bugs. So that person's gonna fix the bug a lot faster if I give them a tiny piece of code that's like shining a laser on the bug than if I give them a bunch of code that tries to explain everything I'm trying to do. Do you agree with that, Bill? <laughs> Bill usually lurks and hides yes. these things. Yes, I, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, will, I will say that uh, Brian Friesen, that nurse, does a very good job of writing reduced test cases and is much appreciated. And it does get your job, your bug fixed quicker if it's comprehensible. <laughs> Okay, so, so thanks very much again. Very interesting talk. I think we, we'll have to move on. And it was unfortunate we had that hiccup in, in the middle. But uh, if you could have a quick look and see if you know there are any unanswered questions in the Slack. But I, th I think we were quite well covered. So th thanks again. So